We live in a very feeling sensitive culture and it is very easy to uh, go by the flow with what everyone in society is doing. It's been incredibly revolting to me, but I quite often catch myself following that pattern. It's very sad. The Bible-believing churches have lost their aggression, their attack mode, their forward moment, their strength, their strength and their patience. Instead, they play victimization. They complain and whine very easily. And when we serve God, listen, we serve God by depending how we feel about it. I would like to talk about an era that is exactly like our era. An era where everything is falling apart, things are going into chaos mode. You've heard your pastor quite often talk about it in history class, and his favorite passage was always Judges 21, 25, where it says, there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It was completely anarchy, and democracy is no longer democracy insanity, but rather insanity mode, and it's turning more into anarchy which demands now a one king system as Judges 21, 25 predicted about human nature and behavior. So I would like to examine God's people during this time period on how they served him and why can't men learn from history? What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. And when I read this passage, I see so much gleaning, gleanings of ourselves, but I just never saw it that way before. And I would like to preach to you what I discovered that might incredibly help you if you feel like that your service for the Lord and your behavior and everything you live for in life is bound by a feeling fleshly system that you just despise and you want to overcome, but it's just so hard and you can't help it yourself. So I hope that this passage will be eye-opening when we look at Judges chapter 20 and verse 18. And the children of Israel rose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. And the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day 20 and 2,000 men. And the people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set their battle against an array, the place where they put themselves in array the first day. And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against him. And the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day, and Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed town to the ground of the children of Israel. Again, 18,000 men. All these drew the sword. Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came into the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Israel, my uh, children of Benjamin, my brother? Or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. This is a passage that many Christians have struggled to understand. Because the children of Israel were trying to follow what is right for the Lord. They were going out against their brother, the children of Benjamin, who committed an atrocious act, an atrocious act of sodomy and murder. Because of that, the children of Israel wanted to make sure that justice was served, punishment was rightfully given to those evildoers. They even prayed to the Lord. They were sincere. They gathered themselves together. They assembled. You'll notice verses that talk about assembling. Why that's similar to a church. You'll notice they match up pretty well to a Bible-believing church that would assemble and they would even pray to the Lord 
put their whole heart into it and make sure that evil was fought against, that they would not compromise with evil. That sounds like a King James only dispensational Bible believing Christian and yet God had them suffer defeat. And God did not, it did not look like God answered their prayers in a mighty way. It looked like that God was slaughtering them for doing something right. How could thousands of innocent people die for trying to follow the Lord and God would let them down like that? Until the third time, God said, go up and I'll give you the victory. Quite often I struggled with that passage. There are some people who propose several answers and you'll notice from that passage that when they prayed to the Lord, they did not do it the right way. Until the third time, they offered up sacrifices. They had the priests there and the Ark of the Covenant, and they did everything biblically right. And because they did follow what is biblical, God answered their prayer with great success, and they finally conquered the Benjamites. But I would like to say that I don't think that that's more of the root answer or the deeper issue of the children of Israel. I don't think it's because they just simply did not follow the Bible. Although that is the right answer, I believe there is a deeper root that is very similar to us. Because to us, Bible-believing, King James-only, dispensational Christians, we are like these Jews where we try to follow the Lord the right way with all sincerity and we pray and we do all these things and yet, why do bad things happen to us as if God is not on our side and we suffer defeat after defeat? I think the deeper root and the cause with the children of Israel, like we do, is the verse... The last verse, Judges 21, 25. Every man did that which was right. That which was right. That's a King James only Bible-believing Christian. That's a truther doing what's right in his own eyes. What does that mean? How we feel is right. How we feel is right. Why? Because it's a feeling society we live in. You ever felt so right before and yet you were totally wrong and it had terrible repercussions? That's right. Come on. How can God do that to his children? Makes us paranoid in our walk with Jesus. Am I doing what's right? Rather than finding peace and confirmation and following the will of God without question. So how can we resolve this issue? The key is if you don't have that feeling of the flesh. If you always go by feeling what's right, feeling what's right, then you are in detrimental pain and destruction. And because we live in this kind of society, I'm pretty sure that most of us are serving God the wrong way because we do that which is right in our own eyes. I would like to give you some gleanings from what we can learn from our history that we're supposed to learn from history and see why such horrible things happen to us, why we're serving God the wrong way, even though we believe it's right. I believe the root issue is because we feel like it's right, because it feels good. And that's what, exactly what those Israelites had. Will you pray with me? Father God, fill within me the power of the Holy Spirit and unction from on high and wisdom to preach. May the preaching convict and change lives. May you get the glory. May it open our eyes what kind of Bible believers we are, that we are actually not in the right, and that we'll repent and we'll change and that we'll be able to live lives that will glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now I want you to look at verses 1 through 2. <coughs> verses 1 through 2. Then all the children of Israel went out and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan to even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpah, and the chief of all the people, even of all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew sword. This sounds like a group of Bible believers in the last days of Laodicea, where everything is falling into chaos, and what they do is we've got to assemble together. 
We got to work in unity as Bible believers and rather than in unity with the lost world, rather than with apostate Christians. And we got to rally ourselves and serve God. We can't just believe and know it in our minds. We got to actually do something. Notice right here, they assembled. They were going to actually do something about it. They had their swords. They had their shields. They had every intention to fight against the evil of this world. They were moved to do it. They were moved to do what seems right, not moved to do what's actually right. And that's my first point, moved on what seems right. You might say, why were they wrong right here? You know what caused them to move? Didn't you know that? Didn't you think about it? What caused them to move? It wasn't the preaching of the word of God. It wasn't the preaching of the word of God that moved them to, hey, let's attend a Bible-believing church together. Let's have a local assembly together and let's fight on for Jesus Christ. They never had that in mind. It wasn't their reading of the word of God. The Bible never even mentions they were reading the word of God. The Bible never even mentions they even pray. What moved them to rally together was a piece of rotten flesh. If you look at the previous chapter, the previous chapter, look at verse 29. And when he was come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into 12 pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel and it was so that all that saw it said, there was no such deed done, nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. Notice that they were moved at the last part of verse 30. They were moved. Something motivated them to take action. Consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. What moved them? A piece of dead flesh. A Levite saw the horrible sodomy and murder, sodomizing and murder of that poor concubine. There were sodomites who sexually assaulted her, killed her, tortured her, used her, killed her. They had intentions, those Benjamites, those Benjamite sodomites, they wanted the man, the Levite, actually. But then the concubine was a replacement. When the Levites saw that, instead of street preaching or giving the word of God or doing what's biblical, he did the, uh, he did the most awful thing by dismembering her body, cutting her to pieces, and sending it to 12 tribes of Israel so that they can take action against the sin. Why would he do something like that? Because that's what's going to move them. That's what's going to stir them up. Get them inspired to serve God as last day Christians in the Laodicean age and we're going to fight the evil when there's a dismembered body, when there's a piece of rotten flesh. Notice flesh is what motivated them. Flesh is what moved them. You know what the problem with us Bible believers today is? Yeah, we're moved to serve God. Man, we got a lot of passion in this church. We got fire. And was it a piece of dead flesh, I wonder, that moved you? You know, soul winning is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. We get pumped up. We get moved, fired up. We're trying to win a lot of souls to the Lord Jesus Christ. But then you get out of balance. And then your family is suffering when you should be thinking about them. You haven't done your Bible reading and prayer because you're, all you're thinking about is souls. Sometimes you get out of balance in soul winning where you should use more wisdom, but instead you're like, no, I need to get that soul saved. Oh, you need? Is that your fleshly feeling there? Is, shouldn't it be the Lord that gives you the soul? And if it's not his will, then he's not going to give that soul to you because he's not going to enforce that person's free will against it. Sometimes we get out of balance in soul winning and even our spiritual duties. Sometimes we can be so caught up with Bible reading, prayer, and studying the Word of God, coming to a Bible-believing church, getting involved and participating in everything, and then you get so out of balance, you neglect your work. And that's why some of you still have, are suffering in your jobs or have no jobs. 
That's why your home life is messed up. Fine example, you are getting so much involved in the ministry and you become a teacher and a leader, and then your home is messed up. Fine example, you're displaying to the rest of the people. How can they trust you after that? When you get out of balance, when you don't follow God's will in the priorities he's given to you in your life, that's not spiritual, that's fleshly. Do you understand? So when you get moved to do a service, a spiritual task for God, you know what that is? If it's out of balance, that's fleshly, that's not spiritual. Did you get that through your thick heads? Some people do street preaching. That's a spiritual duty for God. And then they can get so out of balance that it's easy to get in the flesh and angry, say the wrong words, lose your Christian testimony, and the whole world sees you with legitimacy where they catch you as an angry, fanatical, messed up person who doesn't really care about their soul and just wants to get involved in a fight and deliberately stir up fights. What's that? That's a rebel. That's a person who wants to start a riot. But street preaching, it's the right thing to do. And you get so moved in street preaching and you want to get those souls saved and then it's out of balance. You lose self-control. You lose your voice. You lose your patience, your temperament. And then when you get into the feelings of the flesh and ah, like that, and guess what? That's fleshly, not spiritual. Some people believe that God called me to the ministry, called me to a foreign field so that I can be able to bring more Bible-believing truth and spread it out for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by doing that, sometimes the Lord's will is, no, I don't want you to be a missionary. I don't want you to be a preacher. Well, let me do something special for you, Lord. All right, here it is. Come to a Bible-believing church. Just be a blessing to the brother and sister next to you and the pastor. Just clean the bench, set up kitchen, do the best that you can. And be a good father, be a good mother. Be a good son and daughter to the family. And work in a normal job and make money. That sounds too normal, God. That's what I called you to be. No, I believe God called me to preach the word of God. I got to do something real and then, whoa. So is that a fleshly tendency then where you want more attention? Because you're not content with the little things God gave to you? So you get moved to preach. You get moved to become a missionary. And nothing's going to make you quit the ministry. And all of that is stubbornness of the flesh rather than spiritual conviction. You get moved to do what seems right to you. But it's never right when you're out of balance and when you contradict God's will upon your life. You think that as long as I sing and shout amen and run around the room, then I'm so spiritual. A lot of you just do that where because of the feelings of the flesh, it just feels good. Not because of, I'm doing this for you, Lord, because it's spiritual. Some people can get out of balance with that too. And rather than edify the church, they harm the church. Some people might make sure that sin is rebuked, that sin is taken care of in the church, sin is taken care of in their home. But then they can get in the flesh right there. They can get out of balance. And then they can say words that hurt people because you're trying to be spiritual and rebuke them for the, their sin and instead of focusing on helping them. Helping them. And you become prideful and arrogant and pharisaical. Moved in doing what's right in your own eyes. Why? Why did you do those things? Why did you sow in? Piece of flesh, that's why. Just a piece to please your flesh, that's why. Why did you read your Bible and pray? Oh, not a spiritual reason. A piece that just satisfied your flesh. Why did you get involved in the ministry, get involved with God's work? Become out of balance and taking care of family, your normal life, your own health, and, every, and you just harm your loved ones around you? All because a peace that just satisfied your flesh. 
You can be so strong in your spiritual conviction, but what's feeding that spiritual conviction is not God's will, nor the word of God, but a piece of flesh. And the devil will keep feeding you another piece of flesh and another piece of flesh and another piece of flesh to make you more convinced in your spiritual conviction. And you go down a wrong path. What's moving you to serve God? Because God told you or because it, it's a peace that satisfies and fulfills your flesh? What is it, church? What is it? Even when you shout amen and run around the room, is it a peace that just satisfies your flesh? You do it because other people do it, huh? You sow win because other people do it? You preach because other people do it? You sing because other people do it? You do it because of other flesh doing it? Then it's a fleshly motivation. I thought we're supposed to do it because God told us to. You get moved to serve God because pastor is revved up. Pastor has his voice back and it's powerful. Pastor singing great, so I got to sing great. Pastor shouting, so I got to shout. Pastor has the motivation for soul winning, so I got to get motivated. Pastor is uh, amped up against sin, so I got to get amped up. That's your fleshly motivation. You know what it was? A piece of flesh. And that piece of dismembered body and flesh is named Gene Kim. That's your motivation to serve God, huh? Then you're going to miss out in verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3, Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpah. Then said the children of Israel, Tell us, how was this wickedness? You know, the, the children of Israel, they were so blind that whole time. It's not like this group of Benjamites, these Sodomites just committed rape and murder just like, hey, it just happened and we overlooked it. No. You don't end up with an atrocious act like that unless you let sin keep growing and letting it go. Let's see what happened when we go back to Judges. Keep your hand here. Keep your hand here. Go to the book of Judges, chapter 2. Judges, chapter 2. You know what I think? Go to Judges, chapter 1, excuse me. Chapter 1. I think it's because the reason why they lose track of the wickedness is because of their feelings. See, they were feeling amped up. They were moved to serve God and glorify him and fight against this evil, atrocious thing. So they always went by feelings that time. And if that's your motivation to serve God always, because if I feel like it, I feel like it. I mean, if everybody marches around the room, it makes you feel like it, right? I don't care if it's three. It ought to be just three. Or one, I don't care. You shouldn't do it just because other people do it. You shouldn't just help out the kitchen and then be kind and loving to others because somebody else does it. Right. You should just do it. Yeah. Yeah. But if you always go by because people do things or because that's how you feel, you just feel like it, then guess what? If you don't feel like it, what are you going to do then? If you don't feel like it, you ain't going to march around the room. Yeah. If you don't feel like it, you're not going to say amen. If you don't feel like it, you're going to be the most unloving person in the church. Because there are times you just don't feel like it. But when people love you, it just makes you feel loved and you want to show love back to them, huh? That's a typical humanitarian liberal thing to do, huh? What about loving the person when they mistreat you? When it puts up your test, your patience, and you've got to love them as Jesus Christ loved you. You try that for size, huh, fella? Yeah. Look at verse 3. Uh, excuse me. Uh, let's look at Judges chapter 1. And notice in verse 21. The Benjamites were the one that did the evil, correct? And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. 
Now, why is that verse important? Because a lot of you don't know this, those Sodomite Benjamites, I believe they, they can have learned that themselves. They learned that from their Jebusite friends. Did you look at Judges 19? Judges 19, that Levite with his soon-to-be-dead concubine, they were going to the Jebusites area first. But the Levites said, we're not going there. We're going to go to the Benjamites. The Benjamites were living with them. And when they went to the Benjamites, the Benjamites did an atrocious act. Where did they learn that from? From their neighbor next door. From the Jebusites. You didn't read the book of Leviticus? God warned them that the Canaanites of that land, including the Jebusites, did those horrendous acts. Horrendous sexual murderous acts. That's the only way Benjamin could have learned it from. And the, notice right here, verse 21, there is not a single answer right here of how Benjamin ended up that way. There is no single answer here about Israelites, why they allowed that to happen. There is no answer. You know why? It's very simple. There's no cause or reason to why they just allowed this sin to grow where they committed the, the sexual atrocious murderous act. There's no detailed explanation to how it amped up and ended up right there. But we do know it started because at the beginning they learned it from the Jebusites. So why didn't they take action from the Jebusites? No specific answer except all we can know is they just didn't feel like it. That's it. There's no answer. Sometimes there's no specific answer to why you don't read your Bible, why you don't shout, why you wouldn't march around the room, why you wouldn't soul win, why you won't serve God, or why you skip church that day. I mean, you can come up with a billion reasons and causes. Work, busy, health, I just got something going on, sick or whatever. But if we're going to be totally honest, we just don't know how it happened, how we ended up with our apostate wicked state. We just don't know how it happened. All we do know is from the beginning, just didn't feel like it. Why don't you read the Bible? I just don't feel like it. Why don't you come to church? I just don't feel like it. Why won't you shout amen? I just don't feel like it. Why won't you run around the room? I just don't feel like it. Why won't you win a soul to Jesus Christ? I just don't feel like it. See, feelings are the issue. Feelings are the issue. I'm not saying everybody has to run around the room like an idiot, but let me say this, okay? What I'm dealing with is those people who do run around the room, who do shout amen, why is it there are days they don't do it anymore? It's not just different personalities, see that? We know different personalities. There are people who don't shout amen, who don't run around the room. That don't mean they're backslidden. But those who do shout amen, those who do run around the room, when they don't do it anymore, there's a good chance they're backslidden. You might say, why is that? Because they always went by how they felt. I just feel like running. I just feel like saying amen. And then there are days you just don't feel like it. See what I mean? I don't care how different your personality is. One can be more open, more wild. Some can be more reserved. But we can tell you're backsliding. When you're not what? When you're not the same as before in what you did for the Lord. And we know exactly why you didn't feel like it. No specific explanation. You just don't feel like it. Can anyone explain the feelings of our flesh? It's a complicated creature. You can go psychological, go to the deep roots and causes a bad traumatic experience, your personalities differ, and then we can go to Carl Jung, the unconscious collective thing, and blah, 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 blah. No matter how specific you trace those roots, one thing that I do know, it just comes down to this. The whole bottom line is your flesh didn't feel like doing it. That's why you skipped serving God. That's why you messed up, plain and simple. That's why you missed out and you wonder, like the, like the children of Israel, how was this wickedness? Are you kidding me? People will not keep track with how they ended up where they're at right now in a backslidden state or in their cold service for God 
You don't really tend to keep track. You won't know. Do you feel like that? You feel like your service for the Lord has not just been as fired up as before? Are you that person that just feel like, man, I've just not been close to the Lord as I was before? Something happened. When you look at yourself years back and you're like, man, I used to do this for the Lord, this for the Lord. Why don't I do it anymore? How was this wickedness? How was this wickedness? I promise you this, you can't keep track. You won't know. Why? Because you never kept track in your mind and made markers on your calendar. No one does that. We just live life to how we feel things. We just went by how we felt. And when you ever go by feelings, you'll never keep track. Yeah, amen, bless God, preach, park it right there. That's the reason why you wonder how we ended up in this kind of broken society. Why the economy is falling apart. Why people have bad customer service with businesses over here. Why governments fail their duty. Why people always whine and complain and do victimization. They always live by the rotten feelings. They live for God, they serve for God by their feelings. That's what you see in 99% of churches nowadays. Feeling, feeling, feeling. You just feel like it. So then you'll come to church. Get rid of that. You just do it because God told you to do it. Amen. Because it's right. You know what gets people out of church, gets offended? Feeling. Not the word of God. Let's be honest, because how you feel. Why? Because I yelled at you and I just slammed the table. Who feels good after that? You feel like I'm a wacko. You feel like that's a little too strong. You feel a little offended. Let's be honest here. Come on, be real with me here. You will miss out on what seems right because you always went by feelings. Because it doesn't feel, uh, I don't feel it. When you always make that your reason and excuse, you don't say it out loud, but it's unconscious, right? I just don't feel like it. And that's why you skip Bible reading and prayer all this time. Your soul winning has declined. Your amen and your joy for the Lord has declined. Your service for God, the works that you accomplish has declined more and more. I want you to go to Judges 20 again. Judges 20 again, and we'll look at verse 4. Through seven, four through seven. My third point is monstrosity on what seems right. Monstrosity of what seems right, on what seems right. Notice, and the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about upon me by night and thought to have slain me. And my concubine have they forced that she is dead. And I took my concubine and cut her in pieces and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel. For they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Behold, ye are all children of Israel. Give here your advice and counsel. <laughs> the Levite, indifferent without a second thought, without any second thought, explained his reason what seemed right to him. I want justice served. I want punishment to fall on these wicked Benjamites, which is why I dismembered my concubine into 12 pieces and sent it throughout all the land so I can get my point across. That ain't a spiritual explanation. That ain't spiritual. That's just horrible. That's just wicked. That's just, are you crazy? That's just, Levi, you're, you're not in your right mind. But you know what happened to this Levite? He couldn't cut up the woman like that without experience first. I wonder where the Levite can learn to dismember body parts the right way. Maybe the Lord's sacrifices. Those animal sacrifices that Levite knew which parts to cut <clears throat> and divide easily. And that spiritual, sacred, not horrible, 
Not insane, but a spiritual sacred duty of dividing that body of the animal was important so that sins can be forgiven as a sweet incense to God. And that Levite, because he's so used to that spiritual duty, he conflated that with what he felt right. I want justice served against my concubine who was raped and murdered, so I will take this spiritual task, combine it with what I feel right, and divide her body parts into pieces for the glory of Jesus Christ as well. That's monstrosity! Right. Not spirituality. That's monstrosity! You know what creates monstrosity? Because those spiritual things that you're so used to doing for the Lord, and you thought that what you did was right, if, you're not, if you don't keep your feelings in check, see, if you don't get rid of those wicked feelings of yours, one day you're going to confuse the two. And when you confuse the two, you're going to conflate and combine that spiritual task like that Levi with what I sacrificed, what I did for God as a King James only, Bible-believing Christian, street preaching, soul winning, rebuking sin, standing up for Jesus Christ, loving one another. And, and you will combine those spiritual things with your fleshy, fleshly feelings and create a monstrosity, not a spirituality, but a monstrosity that is horrifying and brings disgrace to the name of Jesus Christ. And you thought at the judgment seat of Christ you're going to be proud of yourself when you give your work to God and God says, no, you make me puke. That should burn. That's a monstrosity what you did. Why? You lost your discernment. You can't tell the difference anymore with what's spiritual and fleshly because you've been so used to feeling fleshly things while doing your spiritual works for God. And you lost the distinction now of what's fleshly and spiritual. You lost that ability, that capacity now. Go back. Where did it all begin? You got to keep your feelings in check. You can't just serve God because I feel like it. See? You got to examine your works and say, is this out of balance? You got to examine your works and say, am I following the will of God according to the Bible? You got to examine yourself and say, am I doing this because people do it? You're going to create a monstrosity. You know why we get monster churches today? You ever wondered that? Mega monster, horrible, horrifying churches that even liberals can see the hypocrisy and the disdain and the wickedness in them. That it doesn't take a person with a 10% IQ to see it. Do you know why? It's because that monstrosity was created by people who always have to feel something. And that's the reason why they conflated that with monstrosity of contemporary music, contemporary dressing, feeling good in speaking in tongues, feeling good in healing lines, feeling, feeling in visions and dreams, and feeling what they seem right from what the preacher said from the Bible. Shame on you! You're going to judge everything by how, if, how you feel? Then this church won't last forever. Does a blowout and an iron sharpness iron conference have to always make you feel something? Does fellowship always have to make you feel something? I'll tell you, with some people here, when they started out in fellowship, some of them, it felt tense. It didn't feel good. It felt tense. Now they feel good because they've learned to overcome their flesh. But see, things in life, revival meetings, don't come by always. You have to set the right mood with Pastor Kim setting up Christmas lights in the, eye, in the alley over there and make the mood just right. Let's look at Judges 20 again. Judges 20. Let's look at verse 18. Judges chapter 20. Read verse 18. My fourth point is massacre on what seems right. Massacre on what seems right. 
And the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, Which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. And the children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. <clears throat> and the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin. And the men of Israel put themselves in array to fight against them at Gibeah. And the children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites that day twenty and two thousand men. And the men, the people, the men of Israel encouraged themselves. So they're not going to get discouraged. They're going to say, no, this is our spiritual conviction. We've got to conquer this evil. So I don't care if God let us down and 22,000 of us died, we're going to believe, put our trust in God. I'm going to go by my spiritual conviction and fight them again. Verse 23, and the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord saying, shall I go up again to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, go up against him. See, I told you so. God even answered my prayer. So I'm going to do it again, no matter what. And the children of, verse 24, and the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel again, 18,000 men. All these drew the sword. Horrible. Horrible. Does that sound like you? You got your spiritual conviction because you're a Bible believer. You know it all. You've got the experience. God dealt with you so many times, so you know what you're doing. And 22,000 can be slain and killed, but you're going to choose to trust and put your faith in God and do it anyway when you are not in the will of God. Because God answered your prayer. Do it. And that's the reason why you did it. Sounds like you a bit? Sounds like reality, maybe? That never happened to you? Come on. Really? Come on. Didn't there come a time in your life you thought it was a spiritual conviction of yours? And you thought that it was right, the right thing to do for God. And you sacrificed, sacrificed thousands, 22,000. You made so much sacrifice and pain and hurt to meet up your spiritual conviction because it's the right thing to do for the Lord. And you chose to blindly put your faith in God no matter what. And even God answered the prayer and said, you're supposed to do it. And then... It didn't turn out to be the will of God? That never happened to you? Man, the only answer then is God is unfair or there's something that you're doing wrong. Huh. We see verse 26, 27, right? They... they did the sacrifice, they offered burnt offering, they brought the Ark of the Covenant. They did everything biblically this time. They did everything right, as best as they could. So the question is, why didn't they do that in the previous prayers? Why didn't they do that at the very beginning? You know why? They chose to go by what they felt was right rather than what is actually right from the Word of God. Simple. It wasn't hard. Listen, God is never unfair or mean when you do something right that is according to the word of God, that is what God wants. God will never be mean or unfair or hurt you even if you make some mistakes unintentionally. Understand that. But when you have 22,000 dead, that's serious and that means something went wrong. The only explanation you can get out of that, why they didn't follow biblically when they were supposed to at the beginning, is because they just didn't feel like reading their Bibles. They didn't feel like that they had to do that much research. They feel like they didn't have to take the time to pray. Did you notice also God answered their prayer, go up? Well, why would God support what they did if what they did was wrong? Because God will give you what you want. God will give you how you feel and support your feelings. How many people who are so much off in wrong doctrine, they always say, you don't know what I experienced. Jesus told me, I felt it, I saw it, you were never there. Yeah, 
How, ma- how much has been massacred for you when you felt like it was the right thing to do? How many had to die? Oh, only 20,000 minutes probably, right? 20,000 hours, 22,000 hours. And all that time was wasted on needless deaths, needless waste of time. 22,000 hours of your life has been wasted. 22,000 minutes have been wasted on things that you could have done for the Lord, things you could have accomplished, but you wasted it because what you felt was right in your heart, because your heart is so trustworthy. How many had to die? Oh, just 22,000 brain cells, that's it, out of pure sheer stress. Needless waste of time of trusting and having faith in God in what you felt was right when God wasn't a part of it at all. Just 22,000 brain cells of losing peace, losing joy. Well, I know this is the will of God, so I'm supposed to do it. Then why are you not at peace about it? Why are you not happy with it? 22,000 brain cells had to die. That had to be sacrificed, your peace and joy. It's too much to say 22,000 people you've harmed for what you felt was right. Huh? Then isn't just one life that you harmed damaging enough from what you felt was right? That was your loved one? That was someone close to your heart in your home? That was a soul, a soul you could have led to Christ, been saved from the damnation and flames of hell. You you just damaged, all you did was damage just one soul, that's it. I mean, it's just one soul crying out for billions of years in hell and never seeing the light of day, never seeing hope in Jesus Christ. That's all you've let down is just one soul, not a big deal. All you've let down is one child in your home, that's it. I mean, that child didn't mean much to you to begin with. I mean, if by your example, you're going to fall into a ditch and let your family fall into a ditch with you. I mean, it's just one child. What's the big deal? It's only one prodigal son, one prodigal daughter. What's the big deal? That's all you damage for what you felt was right. It's only one church. It's only one church you let down. There are so many other Bible-believing churches out there. Not a big deal. That's only one church you've hurt. You've damaged. It's only one pastor. Only one pastor of you hurt. Not a big deal for what you felt was right. It was worth the sacrifice, wasn't it? It was worth it all. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus and you keep convincing yourself, singing that song over and over again. Because it's just one hurt life. It didn't mean much to you. Massacre. You massacred. You massacred that one person's life. You massacred your well-being, your peace in Jesus Christ. You massacred your valuable time that you could have spent for the Lord. My last point is verse 26 through 28. Verse 26 through 28. Meditating on what seems right. Meditating on what seems right. Here's the answer, right? How they resolved it that we could learn from. Look at this prayer. Verse 26, we see, and verse 27, they did everything biblically this time, right? But that's not the root answer. The root answer that was deeper than that, that will be way over your head that you never thought about before and that, wow, I should have contemplated so deeply and I should have read in between the lines more is, no, verse 28, very simple. Notice this prayer at verse 28. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days saying, shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? Four simple words that they never said before. Or shall I, see that, cease. What should be crucified the most? I, 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 me, 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 that's flesh. If that is out of the way, if that ceased and that stopped and that's out of the way, 
there should be no worries or fears and God will take care of, it, take care of you. And no matter how much pain or sacrifices you make, you should be fine as long as, as long as, it's a very important condition, very simple to understand, but can be very hard to do. It is a simple thing to do, but to live it, it's hard. I must cease. Think about it. If God told me that I cannot preach anymore, if God told me I cannot use the internet anymore to reach people, if God told me that I'd done all that I could to counsel a person and must let that person go, I must be willing to die to myself and say, God, whatever you want, I will do it. But no, that ain't going to stop you, huh? Your spiritual conviction. Because you already felt good. You already got the feeling so used to doing that duty for God. And you don't want God to change how you feel. That's exactly your problem. If God told you to stop, then you need to stop. And that's the reason why you always get out of balance. Do you understand that now? Why your flesh gets out of balance in doing a spiritual duty for God, for God is you're not used to self-control. What does self-control mean? Shall I cease? I stop myself. But I ain't going to stop you, huh? You're just arrogant, stubborn, and fleshly. You're not spiritually convicted. You're not full of faith. No, you're just stubborn. You're just arrogant, and you're fleshly. That's your problem. I say that to every Bible-believing pastor in the world, including yours truly. Amen, amen, and amen. Can you stop yourself? You got to meditate. See, you got to pray to the Lord. You got to have a serious reflection, meditate on God's word, and see the weak parts of you and see what's the guilty party, the true enemy. Maybe you're shouting amen and running around the room. It'll be a little different, don't you think so, after that? If you find out, is it me, my feeling? Maybe when you shout amen, it'll be more sincere this time. Maybe there's more spiritual weight behind it this time, rather than, I just felt like it because everybody's doing amen. Maybe when you run around the room even, it might be more spiritual this time. It might be something that edifies people to be happy and to enjoy that moment with the Lord. Maybe the running will seem more spiritual this time and not fleshly because you ceased your fleshly lusts, your feelings first. Maybe if you ceased your flesh before you get involved in a ministerial work or in soul winning, reading the Bible, praying, something of your flesh you ceased first, it will be more spiritual this time. You just have to stop, I. Shall I cease? You just have to stop yourself. That's it. You just have to stop your flesh. That's it. And maybe your soul winning will dramatically improve. Maybe your love for other brethren in church will dramatically improve. And maybe, listen, if you preach and teach on this pulpit, maybe that will improve too. If you ceased yourself. And you know what God might do after that? God, you might be surprised, God might not tell you to stop preaching and teaching. God might not tell you, okay, so that's enough singing and shouting and running. God might not tell you stop soul winning. God might give the same answer as he gave to the children of Israel. After they said, shall I cease? You would think God would say, yeah, you should stop because you always went by your feelings. No, God said at verse 28, and the Lord said, go. He said, go up for tomorrow. I will deliver them into thine hand. And they won. But God, I, uh, I thought it was my flesh. That's the reason why you want me to stop that. And God's like, I needed your fleshly feeling to die first before you do that spiritual duty for me. Because if you don't die that fleshly feeling, 
then that fleshly feeling will control your spiritual actions for me rather than me controlling you. You might be surprised how many times God will say, yes, do that spiritual thing for me. You might be surprised God won't tell you to stop. He'll just say go. You might be surprised how many times that when you come before the Lord and pray to the Lord and God never answered that prayer until you say, okay, shall I cease God? And God might say, oh, okay, I'll answer it with a yes this time. And you might go, what in the world? You should have done that earlier. No, God wanted to see if you would kill yourself first on the altar of sacrifice before he gives the spiritual thing to you and grants you the spiritual access to do it. And that is the most amazing, life-changing thing that can happen to you in this wicked feeling at Laodicean age. Now, how about it, church? Are you going to cease your flesh? You know, I, there's another meaning right here. This is really good. Look, look at verse 28. Another meaning here. Shall I cease... And the Lord said, go. Think about it. I cease. The flesh cease. But then God can say, go. Why? Hmm. God knows that those Jews, they always go by feelings, right? God knew that. That's their problem. He allowed them. He allowed them to go by their feelings here to go. Now, we know this because if you look at the next chapter, those Jews never learned their lesson about their feelings. They still did that which was right in their own eyes. So why is it that God said go this time? Listen, there are feelings that you should cease and you know what they are. Those are the wrong feelings. But what about right feelings? What about biblical feelings? What about feelings that follow God's will? Don't you think that God wants you to go for it? You know, here's the thing. The reason why your service for God has been by wrong feelings rather than by right feelings is because you went by feelings that contradicted God's will. You went by feelings because other people did it. You went by feelings that were out of balance. But if you were to cease those things and say, they must die, they're wrong, I'm not going to do it because of those things, don't you feel another part of you that wants to follow God's will? Don't you feel another part of you when God says, this is my will, you want to do it? Isn't there a part of you in there that wants to be happy when you soul in, sing, shout, come to church? Isn't there a feeling in there that wants to just cast away the depression and then go by pure bliss and happiness and peace? Isn't there a feeling like that that God would approve? That God would want for you? How do you get these feelings? If you cease your wrong feelings first, when you cease your wrong feelings first and they die, you go by the right feelings that God would want you to have and you become the most happiest person. Let me give, a very, uh, let me give some examples here. When you come to church, it's wrong to feel depressed. Those are wrong feelings to have, correct? But people who always went by feelings, guess what? It doesn't matter how amped up the revival meeting is, they will feel depressed. Can I repeat that again? It doesn't matter how amped up the revival meeting is, if they feel depressed, they will always feel depressed no matter how great the preaching or singing is. But let's say that this depression, which is a wrong feeling, I ceased. I cast aside. And there's a part of my heart that's telling me, don't you want to be happy with them? Don't you want to shout amen? Don't you want to feel conviction by the preaching of the word of God? Don't you want to have joy in this revival meeting? There's a part of you that longs for that feeling, doesn't it? Why don't you just, 
like the Lord said, go. Go for it. Well, I can't go for it. Why? Because I don't feel like it. And see, you went by your feelings. You got to cast off the wrong feeling first. Think how your life will dramatically change. Even temptation and sin, how much will be conquered if you cast off the wrong feeling and went by the right feeling? When you go by temptation and addiction and sin, the feeling comes out, I love it. I desire it. But then there's a part of you that feels, I hate it. I feel guilty. Which feeling wins at the end? Unfortunately, the wrong one. But imagine if you ceased the wrong feelings. I love it. I want to feel it. And it was replaced with this feeling, I hate it. I despise it. I fear the Lord. If the wrong feeling ceased and the right feeling, you went for it, just go, you wouldn't sin. You wouldn't mess up. Well, it's hard to conquer sin because you can give a billion excuses, but let's just be honest. It's because you don't feel like conquering the sin. That's it. Come on. It's plain and simple. Why not feel after God? Why not feel after the Holy Spirit? You know what Ephesians warned? Those who are past feeling fell into lasciviousness and sin. Brother, sister in Christ, I know there's a feeling in there. I know deep down inside your heart, you got something that fears the Lord. There's something down there that wants to do what's right. There's something down there that just wants that flesh to cease. There's something down there that wants to be happy. There's something down there that wants to love and follow Jesus Christ. Don't contemplate and wait for a feeling to feel it. Just do what the Lord says. Go for it. Be happy. Go for it. Have peace. Go for it. Rejoice. Go for it. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Just go. Don't feel. Go for it. Friend, there is a feeling inside you right now. And when this altar call opens up, don't let your wrong feeling of fear and shame and guilt control your life. Go for the feeling where the Holy Spirit is pulling you. I want to repent and get right with God. Just go for it after this service is over. Every head bow and every eye shut.